Hi there, this is The Advantage Podcast. We're hacking the art and neuroscience of expert leadership so that you can unstuck your true potential in life and work. I'm Dr. John Kay, I'm your host, and welcome to this episode. What is talent really? Anyway, the purpose of this guide is to clarify the history and etymology of talent from its biblical roots and why this matters in modern business. And I'll do that by showing you the origins of talent and what it really is in today's business context. I'll share why this matters and the implications and how to define it so that everyone is on the same page. The payoff, well, this will enable you to be crystal clear about talent, skills, strengths and potential and form the basis of how we unlock and leverage talent to unstuck potential and develop the skills that you need to thrive. Everyone wants talent, but what is it? Talent. Individuals seek to develop it. Companies want to identify and retain it. Succession planners search for it. Politicians plan for it. The world wants it. There's even a war for it. But what is it exactly? The word talent is banded around for so many things and we don't always truly understand what is meant by talent. This is a real problem because over the centuries the term talent has morphed and become a floating signifier and become a reference to something beyond real life. Something indefinite and indefinable. So when organisations, human resources and leaders spend large sums of money on talent in talent management or talent development, neither they nor we truly know what they mean or to what they refer. Why does this matter? Okay, what if you have a pink pill that makes your work almost effortless, yet simultaneously fulfilling? Every moment at work you are in the zone. You're flowing and your performance is so good and your productivity increases and you are more engaged with your work and with your colleagues. The company who made that pink pill would be worth gazillions and businesses would be clamouring for their workers to take this magnificent drug so they could profit even more and keep staff happily employed and engaged for years to come at higher wages with shorter working hours and greater productivity. All those pink pills would be flying off the shelves faster than a speeding bullet. This is the promise and advantage of leveraging talent. So if we're going to be seeking it, identifying it, retaining it, planning for it and spending large sum of money on something so critically important to our future success, should we know what it is? So to the trusty dictionary, talent, innate, mental or artistic aptitude as opposed to acquired ability, less than genius. Terrific. Thank you very much. And what is innate? Innate. Existing in one from birth. Inborn. Native. For example, innate musical talent. Now, my core business is neuroscience-based coaching for behaviour change. So if talent cannot be acquired or developed, I better go and find a better definition, huh? So, talent. The natural ability to do something well. Uh, hmm, That nasty word, natural. Natural. Based on the state of things in nature. Constituted by nature. 
For example, growth is a natural process. OK, let's try the thesaurus. It's always illuminating. And I find the word talent is associated with words like ability, adeptness, adroitness, charisma, facility, gift, knack, wisdom, gumption, capacity, brilliance and genius. OK, it seems that you are either born with a talent or not. There's no acquiring a talent, using it certainly, but if the foundation is not there, what's a boy to do? Now, companies seek talent for succession planning, as do politicians. It's most often associated with leadership or management talent. And companies are hooked on retaining talent. And surely that's right. Once you have talent in your organisation, you really don't want to lose it. Many, inspired by a McKinsey article in 1997, The War for Talent, took this to extreme, indulging talent and doing everything they could to keep them engaged, satisfied, even delighted. Malcolm Gladwell, author of The Tipping Point, wrote an article in the New Yorker magazine in 2002 entitled The Talent Myth. See, by then, the whole war for talent was under a dark, ominous cloud called Enron. The McKinsey article had, after all, been largely based on what Enron was doing at the time and how everybody should emulate it. And people still hire McKinsey. Hmm. The trouble is that talent is most often ascribed to the very brightest, highly motivated individuals who are very driven. And being bright, intelligent, does not necessarily mean talent. Being driven is not the only criteria for success. Time for a little etymology, which is a fancy Greek word for the history of a word. Talent is most often ascribed to first being used in the Bible. The Hebrew term for talent was kikar, which is a flat, round, gold or silver disc, or a circular-shaped loaf. In the Greek language, the word comes from talanton, a large monetary measurement equal to 6,000 drachmas or denarii, the Greek and Roman silver coins. A person with a talent of gold, even today, would be considered wealthy and successful. Uh, at 60,000 US dollars per kilo in early 2021, and a talent weighing around 35 kilos, that's a couple of a million US dollars. Talent in the late 13th century meant inclination, disposition, will, desire. And it's from Old French, talon, from the 12th century. Itself from medieval Latin, talenta, plural of talentum which is inclination, leaning, will, desire. See, the medieval Latin and common Romanic sense developed from figurative use of the word in the sense of money, meaning special natural ability, aptitude, gift, committed to one for use and improvement. And this developed by the mid 15th century, in part, perhaps from figurative sense, wealth, but mostly from the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 15, verses 14 to 30. It was John Calvin, according to Paul Marshall in his book, A Kind of Life Imposed on Man, Vocation and Social Order from Tyndale to Locke, that helped shape the modern meaning of the word talent by his revolutionary change in the interpretation of the parable of the talents. See, Calvin 
defined the talents as gifts from God in the form of a person's calling or natural ability. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man travelling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. That's from the New King James Version, Matthew 25, 14 to 50. If the concept of talent has its roots in measurement, power and success, then why is evaluating and measuring talent a concept that business leaders struggle with? Is it simply just the idea of having the most talent that lends to creating and growing a successful company? The history behind talent and our inability to effectively measure or assess talent is irony at its finest. But what if talent isn't innate? See, earlier we learned that talent is something you are born with. There's no acquiring of it or developing it. Yet, in his hugely popular book, The Talent Code, Daniel Coyle challenges that, saying that greatness isn't born, but grown. It's not a gift, but something that you develop with deep practice, ignition and master coaching. Talent, according to Coyle, is to do with the myelin coating of the neurons in your brain. The more you practice a skill, the thicker the myelin sheath and the faster those neurons fire, making the whole process increasingly effortless. When you practice something, you repeatedly send electrical impulses along neural circuits in your brain. This triggers the development of myelin around those nerve fibres. Thicker myelin allows faster and more precise responses until the skills seem automatic. They look like talent. And I have to agree completely with Coyle. Heck, I am in the development business, right? Many experiments in neuroscience have shown that repeated practice of specific skills increases myelin thickness, which means that the signals processed through those fibres are faster and have less noise or interference. Thus, the good data gets through more often first time and your response is faster. A myelin sheath is like the plastic coating on the electrical and communication wires in your home and office. And what this means is that less energy is used by the brain and less deliberate conscious effort. Enough practice and this is where where I diverge from coil your skill adeptness looks just like talent so much so that people will call what you are doing talented of course they don't see the years and hours of deep practice that you somehow achieved overnight now I like to use the conscious competence learning model to show how this works. In this model, there are four stages of developing competence in doing something. And you'll find the diagram on the show notes to help you. But at step one, we begin a new skill as unconsciously incompetent. That is, we don't know how much we don't know. As we develop, as we learn in step two, we become increasingly aware of just how much we don't know. We become consciously incompetent. We know what we don't know. We persevere and in step three, after this frustrating period and practice in usually safe environments, until that glorious day when we become consciously competent. We know that we know. And step four is where we continue to use the knowledge and skills we know well and keep on using it until one day 
we are so good at doing it that it's completely natural. It feels effortless. And that's because we've reached unconscious competence. If asked how they do what they do at this point, most people reply, I don't know, I just do it. (music) Refer to the show notes to see the whiteboard diagram. I'm sure it'll help. This skill and its knowledge at step four, where you are unconsciously competent, has become deeply ingrained and no longer requires any conscious thought or effort on our part. It looks exactly the same as a talent. But a talent, on the other hand, is a giftedness that you have. It's something that you do without having had to practice or learn. You will have little if no idea about how you do it. But it's what Mozart had at four years old when he sat before a piano for the first time. So it's a gift, it's deep practice. Do the semantics matter? I actually think it matters a whole heap. It's what happens when what looks like talent gets labelled as something it isn't. And I've seen this in many organisations. The brightest and best are identified as part of the talent pool. There's some funfair, a suite of training programmes, perhaps MBAs are taken and the talent are promoted. Meanwhile, the non-talent morale has sunk. Employee again engagement has plummeted to new lows. Many have quit or are actively updating their CV and LinkedIn profile, seeking new positions. Commitment has dropped and performance suffered. The talent, being highly driven, take this upon themselves and try to make up for the loss, working extra hard and many are burning out. There follows a new initiative to regain the work-life balance and a big drive to retain talent. I recommend you check out Billy Adamson's 2016 paper published in Philosophy of Management. I've linked it in the show notes. It's for a comprehensive and rigorous debate on the vital importance of knowing what talent means. I do believe that we should identify talent because it can be the key to unstucking your true potential and thus unleashing your performance and sustaining it for the long term. And it is only when you are employing your real talent that you truly shine. All is well with your soul because you are using your gifts. Your work is almost effortless and fulfilling. Every moment you are in your flow zone and your performance is astounding. Your productivity increases and you feel truly engaged with your work and your colleagues. You just took the pink pill. When it's the result of deep practice, master coaching and ignition, All the above may be true for a time, even a long time, but eventually it seems that the thrall pales as the ignition moment fades in memory and you begin to wonder what it was you loved so much to make you practice so deeply for so long. Organisations spend a long time and vast sums on managing and developing and retaining talent and they're missing something critically important which is everyone has talent everyone you me and bob next door all have talent you might not know what your talent is yet but i can assure you that you do have a natural giftedness for doing something it will be something that you do exceptionally well and you almost certainly thoroughly enjoy doing it or at least you used to enjoy doing it see the problem for most people is that they no longer have the opportunity to do what they are talented at doing because in and of itself it doesn't pay the bills now after years of research in developing and evaluating competence and competency 
and working in the talent management and development field, teaching, training and coaching, I conclude that talent is your natural giftedness to do something. You may not be using it, but everyone has talent. The skills and abilities we develop through deep practice are a component of our potential. They can be developed such that they closely resemble a talent. To do that, we'll need to unlock your talent to unstuck your potential. Sure, there are some people who show greater abilities than others, but all three servants were given the opportunity to grow their talents according to their abilities. Maybe your natural talent is something that is valued in this world. Maybe you've had to pivot, adapt and do something that you can do well enough, but is far removed from your talent. But it pays the bills. What if I told you that you can find and use your natural giftedness by unlocking your talent and leverage the process to your advantage? That you can do so effortlessly and well in a completely different field. One that you do almost effortlessly. Find fulfilling and engaging and it does pay the bill. How much would that advantage be worth to you? We call it the Advantage Potential to Performance System and I'm happy to share details about how it can work for you and your team. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Advantage Podcast. I've been your host, Dr. John Kay. Do get in touch at leadershipadvantage.com. Bye for now and be greatly blessed. Mm-hmm.